Winter Roses, Summer by Fairy Tale Lover. Chapter 31 Grieving Matters. Ella came to Ned Solar once she heard he'd come back from his talk with the king. Bad news? she asked once she saw his mood. Saucy was there, Ned answered, and she accused me of treason. She heard about the navy and the keeps? Aye, gossip from the other guests. But the gall of her! To accuse me of treason as if she were commenting on the weather! Good thing Robert didn't even consider it, but she was clearly trying to make intrigue. Telling him I'm marrying a commoner, that Robert Marjorie betrothed because I chose to tie a rail because they were Targaryen sympathisers. They are Targaryen sympathisers, Alla thought, and they only chose Rob because they know if Daenerys ever makes a play for the throne, she and Jon will be sure Winterfell is on their side. But she didn't voice it. She knows you're loyal to Robert. And he would never side with her or even compromise your honour. You're not with her. You're her enemy. And therefore, the only way to deal with you is to eliminate you. So it's either kill you, which would be very messy and very well in fight a war, or undermine you. He huffed and she sat back a bit with a smile. Going to sit on the arm of his chair. I was thinking about something on the way over, and I hope you would agree with me. Ned smiled weakly, pulling her down to his lap and putting both arms around her waist. And um, what is my lady wife plotting this time? Why, my lord husband, you make me sound like quite the schemer, she laughed. Bran said he wants to stay in Winterfell instead of facing the long journey here. Ned huffed again, annoyed. Yes, he did. I must be the stalk in Winterfell from now on, father, he said, insisting his dreams told him as such. Well, I won't argue with green dreams. Ah, 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 after the lady, you are not going to argue with it either, are you? Ned pursed his lips. No, I won't. What does it have to do with anything? Well, I was thinking that Rickon could come to the wedding, rather. All right, I'll tell Rob. Rickon will be thrilled, I imagine. I doubt he was happy being left behind. This is what I want to talk to you about, Ella said, and Ned frowned. You said you left Rickon in Winterfell because he was too little. Well, he was four at the time. Yes, but he's nearly six at the wedding. And I'm not diminishing Lady Winifred, but... Ned chuckled. You want him here, under your wings. Don't he want your son here? You know I do, silly. Not diminishing Lady Winifred, but I'd rather have him under our eyes. Good. Ella smiled. Now, I was... A quick knock announced Poole's entrance, and he was immediately embarrassed. Ella cleared her throat and stood up. What is it? Ned asked, uncomfortable. I'm sorry, my lord. The, the High Septon, some word. He would like Ella to come to the Sept of Baylor as soon as she can manage to get arrangements for the wedding set. If I must. Ella sighed. Thank you, Paul. I'll send a message I'm coming over tomorrow. The man bowed his head and turned to leave, but Jory had come into the room as well and as such he blocked the way. Since you two are here, Ned called, you both serve my house and my family faithfully for use, so I know I can trust you with this secret. The king is organising a grand ceremony for my wedding, as I am sure you are aware. However, that is a southern ceremony, to avoid upsetting his grace and the date he has decided upon. We are keeping it private, but we have married in the godswood of the Midnight Fortress before we left. So please, Accord all due respect to the new lady of Winterfell. Well, congratulations, my lord, my lady, Jory said. Poole blushed slightly, but also congratulated them, and the two of them quickly left. Ned stood up, holding his hand out to Ella, when once again there was a knock. She bit back a smile at his murderous glare, then rolled her eyes. That's the service door. It must be only a spider, Lady Stark. Vera said, coming into the room. Catelyn smiled when she saw Peter. The Septers were always furious when he visited. Some even complained about the special treatment for the little lady. But the High Septon was given an order, and none of them would dare question it. He extended a single daisy, as he did every time he visited, knowing that they were her favourite. How are you, Cat? Littlefinger said. Same as you asked me a few days ago. Why are you back so soon? Has something... Your children are fine, Peter was quick to reassure her, and she exhaled in relief. 
They have just returned from their trip to the Blast Island, though... And their ship brought much gossip. I can only imagine. You said half the realm was invited. And the other half didn't have deep enough pockets. Tell me. Please, Peter. What will certainly make you the happiest is what I discovered of your precious Bran. He will walk again, Cat. Oh, gods! Catelyn exclaimed. Oh, seven blessings! I prayed so much. I must light another candle to the mother. A miracle indeed, my lady. I can only imagine your happiness. What? What else do you know? How is Rob? Well, I imagine, Littlefinger smiled. He had organised his gossip carefully for the greatest impact, and Catelyn was following the song perfectly. He competed in the tourney, but was bested by Prince Oberyn Martell in the quarterfinals. Oh, this will interest you. Rob is betrothed to Marjorie Tyrell. Tyrell? Why ever would Ned make an alliance with the Reach? Food for the coming winter, I suppose. Whenever that might be. I imagine the Tyrells were quite eager to please the Starks after the, re the service rendered by Lord Starling. Catelyn pursed her lips, remembering the story of the tawny of the hand. What news from them? she asked with content. All accounts say that the tawny was very entertaining. Lord Starling won and crowned his wife the Queen of Love and Beauty. The jewellery show also seemed to have been a success, as there's a handful of winter diamonds parading around the city. But the real gem seems to be the Lady Lyanna, who apparently charmed all the present. She's... she is what? Three, four moons old? What were they doing parading her in public? I gathered she went to cheer her father as he sparred with Sir Barristan Selmy. Fools. No proper idea how to raise a child. Catelyn muttered. I wish to hear no more of it. What about the girls? And Rickon? Once again, Rickon was the Stark in Winterfell, so I know nothing. The girls are also fine. I saw them from the window as they rode up Aegon's high hill. What else, Peter? I can see there's something you're not telling me. Littlefinger made a show of being uncomfortable. I wish. I wish I didn't have to tell you this, but you will find out soon enough. Tell me! Lord Stark is marrying again. He confessed, eager to see her reaction. He is marrying the governess. You did what? Tyrion asked after spitting his wine. Gods, you've gone madder than I possibly could have anticipated, sister. But Cersei wasn't vexed. I told him, I heard you the first time. There's no need to repeat your insanity out loud. And now she got angry. He is! Oh, servant house, Cersei! Tyrion exclaimed setting down his goblet on the table with a clunk. The day Ned Stark is less than honourable. The day he really plots treason against Robert. That's when the world has truly gone to shit. Are you utterly, utterly mad to make an accusation like this and in front of Robert? She shrugged. Better in front of Robert than having the honourable Northern Fool come to tell him later his own version of the story. Well, you are not entirely stupid then, thank the gods. Please, Tyrion, what do you know of diplomacy? A great deal more than you, apparently, he replied angrily. Please tell me you do realise the precarious position we are in. You are making matters worse with Eddard Stark will only make things worse for us. I know Ned Stark's presence is troublesome, but I don't see how it's precarious. Tyrion let his chin fall open for a brief moment. She can't be so naive, can she? He thought... My dear sister, you just told me you're aware that Ned Stark's position as Robert's hand is troublesome because he won't be swayed, convinced or bribed to our side. He will stand by Robert come winter or summer. And dear Joffrey made the Starks our great enemies with the insane plot you concocted. If you think it's so ridiculous, why didn't you say something at the time? Instead of you using that tone now. Oh, you mean to tell me you finally told me why Joffrey hasn't joined us at the feast yet? We were already running out of the Great Hall by then. You don't remember? Drawn by Daenerys Targaryen's screams? Starling, Targaryens are dead. Tyrion snorted, but thought the argument was not worth the time. The point is now, Cersei, is that the Starks are our enemies, and with that we lose the Vale and the Riverlands. Hoster Tully will certainly be offended with what's happening to his eldest daughter. Hoster Tully travelled all the way to the capital and was talked to personally to Nadard Stark, and only then was Catelyn sent over to the Sept. 
and it's irrelevant anyway. Rob Stark, the heir to Winterfell, is Tully's grandson, so he is honour and duty bound to be on their side. The same goes for Lysa Arryn, and she wouldn't side with us anyway. Not when she took her son and flew the capital in fear of letting Sweet Robin foster the rock. We still... Also, Rob Stark is betrothed to Marjorie Tyrell. Please tell me you are following the logic there. I need to make Robert send Ned Stark packing. Back to his frozen homeland! Cersei exclaimed, furious and frustrated. Good luck with that, sister. You will certainly need it. But all you've done so far since Winterfell is make Robert angry with you and more pleased with his friend. I'm his wife and queen. Tyrion threw her a disbelieving glare. First, Robert can't stand you. We all know the feeling is mutual. Second, you've just complained loudly and at length about how Robert will cart you off your expenses and is in turn planning to host a lavish wedding to Ned Stark. I'm sure you know that Catelyn Tully is alive and well, locked up in the Sept. We did just mention it. Robert wouldn't dare. Father would. You have to stop relying so heavily on Father. He would defend our house, but even he knows our limits not across. He would never let Robert set me aside. If you start causing too much trouble, he will have no choice, Cersei. Think, if you are caught doing something considered a slight against the king or even his hand, do you really think father can save you? Father is warden of the West. There are seven kingdoms, Cersei. Father only controls one, and the Starks already have the other four. I think that math is easy enough. She exclaimed in anger and stomped out of the room. Tyrion sighed, reaching for his goblet and refilling it. Brat, he muttered. Father told you you're entitled to the world, and you dearly believe it. Danny raced along the trees, confused. All she could see around her were trees. The lush green northern forest and its old trees. She heard noise, shuffling ahead. So she ran, trying to find someone. She knew there was someone. She knew they wanted to tell her something. Then suddenly there was a break in the row of trees. They opened to a clearing, at the centre of which stood a large white weirwood heart tree. Like all heart trees, it had a face carved into it. The wood around Daenerys started to laugh, echoing the face. A laughing tree. She heard shuffling again and turned around. There was a man standing there, a man she recognised from another dream. Long silver gold hair deep indigo eyes and a kind smile. He was smiling too, and carried a harp on his hand. Rhaegar? Danny called, but before he could answer there was a sharp noise, and the dream world dissolved around her. Danny sat up in a jump, startled. She saw the bed next to her empty, so she looked around the room. John was standing next to the fruit basket on their table, looking sheepish. Sorry, he said. I didn't mean to wake you. No, you... What happened? You don't normally wake up in the middle of the night. He chuckled. Ghost Lady and Nymeria went hunting. It's Lady's first hunt since they've been back, so they're very excited. They caught a deer, so I woke up hungry. She chuckled as well. I suppose there are downsides to this. John shrugged, bringing a bunch of grapes back to bed. What about you? The dream of the black dragon again? Not quite, she said, pensive. I was... I was in a forest, and the trees were laughing, and Rhaegar was there. That's a new one. John frowned. The trees were laughing? What do you think that means? No idea. There was a weirwood in a clearing, and it had a laughing face, and that's when the other trees started to laugh. Perhaps this was just a weird, normal dream. Like a regular person, not a Targaryen dragon dream. Danny rolled a grape between her fingers. Then she chuckled. What a pair we make. Prophetic dreams and walking. Maybe Lyanna will have both. The poor girl. She'll never sleep. John laughed and put the bunch of leftovers aside. Well, I happen to know a way to put us both to sleep deeply. She joined in his laughter. Oh, do you, Lord Starling? Does that involve a bedtime story? His eyes shone with dark promise. Not one children can hear. Dear Artie, you are a bullheaded fool as well, but I love you anyway. 
The useless, spineless fool we must now call a king is meddling and had decided our wedding is to take place on the first week of the eighth moon this year. Before you start sputtering in anger, I care not that I must wait another four moons because we are already married before the old gods of the forest. Ned wanted our union to be blessed by his gods and though we couldn't go as far as Winterfell, it felt right to do it in the north. We only had Benjamin as a witness, but I could use my name and my house instead of a lie that I had to use in order to stay at the Sept. So there you have it. He has already made an honest woman out of me. I have managed to tell Edric and he only sniggered, saying he will make sure Lord Dondarrion will be in King's Landing for the occasion. Whatever else he is plotting, I have no idea. Speaking of Lyanna, John's daughter already shows that she is as spirited and willful as her grandmother. God help us when she grows up and makes us all nostalgic. In his studies of magic and prophecies, do you know what, if anything, Rhaegar learned about wargs and green dreams? I know it is something that comes from the children of the forest, passing to the first men through marriage. But the children are experiencing the bond with their direwolves. Yes, each Stark child has their own direwolf companion, and they share their eyes at night. The tiny Granog man, Howland Reed, understands a bit about the subject, and has sent his son to foster in Winterfell and guide Robin Bran. His good sister, also a Cranog woman, is coming to King's Landing to teach Sansa and Arya, and there's already a son of a Cranog man in the Blessed Island, so he will teach John. How is your life, brother? I know you're upset about having to hide out in a hut, but we must all do our parts. Having you become a hermit and stay locked in a threatening any neighbour who comes to stop to say hello? Are you terrorising the troublesome children who dare disturb your peace? I do agree, by the way, that we must write more. Your handwriting is terrible. Please do practice, son. Ashara Stark, Lady of Winterfell. It was her first time using the Stark seal, and Ella felt almost giddy, like the silly girl who had fallen in love with Ned at Harrenhal. But 18 long years and a ton of shit that had happened between then and now, and she could still only smile. Ashara Stark, Lady of Winterfell. It made the silly butterflies flutter in her stomach. She put her weights on the four corners of the parchment so it wouldn't roll up as it dried and went to the fireplace, carefully disposing of the mixture that made the ink invisible to the naked eye. Dawn, the hawk, watched her movements with half bored look, aware that she was about to travel again. Ella had rolled her eyes at her sister when she stopped by Starfall, nearly two years ago now. Big Brother had allowed her to name one of the special messenger falcons House Danebred, unknown to the other kingdoms and children of houses and Alaria, in her childish wisdom, had decided since there was no current active Sword of the Morning that she would name the bird Dawn. Ella looked down at the now empty little bowl. I'll tell Arthur in the next letter, she decided, unwilling to make more ink. He will have a kick out of it. She folded the now dry parchment and carefully slid it into the leather pouch. Dawn stretched on the windowsill, shaking off her lazy morning, and spread her wings so Ella could put on the breastplate in place. But before she could even get to the window, Sansa and Arya came barreling through the door. Are you going to the sub today? Sansa asked quickly. Ella raised an eyebrow on the girl blushed. Sorry, we should have knocked. Is that a hawk? Arya asked unabashed. Yes, Ella chuckled. Her name is Dawn. Come on, she won't bite you. Arya smiled and cautiously came to the window. Dawn looked at her warily, but allowed the approach and even the touch. She's beautiful, the girl exclaimed. I didn't know you liked hawking. She came to the window one day and stayed. Ella answered, more like Alaria sent a letter and told her to stay with me. Can you teach us? Arya asked. Sansa, more cautious than her sister, approached more slowly, but also touched the soft white plumage. Of course, Ella answered. She's about to go hunting, but I'll get us new hawks. How does that sound? Both girls like that idea. Not today, though. Today we are going to the Sept. All three of us? Ella nodded. I'm sure if you behave, the High Septon will agree to let you see your mother. Would you like that? They nodded eagerly. So, come on. Let's get going. We saw Father leaving already. That's a bit earlier than usual. Arya said. And he was very unhappy. What's wrong? 
small council business, Ella answered. Nothing for you two to worry about. Now, come on. Sir Merrin and Sir Boris were shocked when Ned showed up and demanded an audience with the king. The ever grumpy Sir Merrin tried to block his passage, saying that the king hadn't awoken yet, but Ned wasn't moved. Well, then I suppose he will wake in a very sudden and angry mood. Ned snapped shortly. Move aside! Neither knight moved. I'll make it easier for you to understand, sirs. I am the hand of the king, and there is only one man who holds more power than I in this realm. Therefore, if the king has commanded you to bar my passage, by all means, stand there. Otherwise, when I say jump, I kindly suggest you ask me how high. Both men were startled by the sudden shortness. What is the meaning of this ruckus? Robert demanded, opening the door in his nightwear. Ned, what in the seven hells happened that you're at my door at this ungodly hour? We have royal business to discuss, your grace. Now. Robert frowned, but opened the door and retreated inside the room. Ned shouldered his way past the two king's guards, closing the door behind himself. You must have grave news, the king said, going to pour himself wine. Nothing else would bring you here at dawn. Ned rolled his eyes and bit back a snort. It's past mid-morning already, Robert, and there's no shorter than three urgent matters we must discuss immediately. Is it about the Targaryen boy? That too. Lord Varys received whispers he is moving from Pentos to Valantis. Ah, and that's significant because that's where the Golden Company is. Oh, well, Lord Varys is, of course, already spreading more of his little birds. The Dothraki were a more distant threat, since they don't have ships and wouldn't cross the sea. The Golden Company, however, is another story. That means it is imperative that the Royal Fleet is up to its best capacity. Robert nodded. Where's Stannis? Hold up in Dragonstone, if you'll forgive me the bluntness. You sent him a raven? I did, and I got no reply again. I met one of his men, Sir Davos Seaworth, at the Midnight Fortress. He didn't confirm Lord Stannis was ignoring the message, but that was the idea I got. Very well. The fucking bitch has had his tantrum. He's been away for over a year. Send him a final notice to come to court in a week's time, or he's forfeited the position. That he can't say, I'm not fair. Good, Ned said. And I kindly ask, if Lord Stannis does indeed renounce his position, that I'm allowed to fill in the seating with a man of my trusting. Granted, it will do those bitches good to have more northern blood here. Perhaps that lord was supposed to become John's overlord, and tell him the king approves of his nomination. House Manderley will be most pleased. I'll also make it sure that the navy has enough ships. On that note, I would also like to talk to you about the situation with House Aaron. We've spoken about it, nerd. Let the widow handle the boy and the veil. Jamie Lannister is the Warden of the East. Well, you've made the decision and the announcement, so I know no good will come from arguing. But you do know as well as I do that the Veil men will not follow Jamie Lannister's command. They will! Robert started, but then huffed at Ned's raised brow. Fine, I can see that. It was a harsh decision. Are you happy that I've admitted it? Slightly, Ned said. The Knights of the Veil will only follow a man from the Veil, as you well know. The Lord of the Vale is a child, and a delicate one at that. So I'd suggest that, while Lysa Arryn, as the mother, is allowed to oversee the day-to-day -day ruling and politics of the kingdom, we install a Vale man as commander of the Arryn forces. Fine, fine. I will. Robert, do not irritate them more than you already have by giving their title to Jamie Lannister. Choose a man whom John Arryn would choose. You are in a mood today, my friend. Ned glared at him. I am. We'll get to that. Right after you think about Lord Yon Royce. He was John Aaron's right hand, wasn't he? Robert asked, and Ned nodded. Very well. Have it done. Leave the widow as regent of the Vale and Royce as Lord Protector. Good. Now that that is settled, Ned said, feeling his anger rising again. I see we arrived at the point that's grieving you. What is it? Tywin Lannister has been plotting to pass a new law. Ned said through clenched teeth. Robert's mood soured. And how does he intend to do that if he is not on my small council? Considering what Lord Varys and Renly told me, Lannister intends to lure out other Lord Paramounts to our his idea, and if all else fails, he'll call for the Crown's debt. That is too stupid a move to come from Tywin Lannister. 
Robert said. The man can be ruthless. Fine. But he is a cunning bitch. A move like that matches his boldness, but not his cunning. That is what I thought as well. So we have two options. Where, Jar? Right. Ned exhaled. Either someone is playing games and laying the blame on Tywin Lannister, which is worrying for a number of reasons. Or... Or he's too desperate to think clearly. End of chapter. Hi guys, hope you enjoyed that one. I like that, though my throat is sore from all those deep voices. Ow. So, Sansa, Arya and Ella are going to see Catelyn. Oh boy. And also, I like that now that he's with Ella, Ned is much more attuned to the Game of Thrones. He is able to see what Tywin is doing. I like that. And he's a and you can see the way he's able to talk Robert around. Anyway, my throat's way too sore to carry on with this outro. You guys know the drill. Like, comment and subscribe and hit that bell to get notified for whenever I upload a new video. Have a good day, night or whatever time zone you're in. Bye my guys, girls and all binary pals. I'll see you in another video. Take care.